Michelle Slater had a long battle with and recovery from late stage neurological Lyme disease, which served as the genesis for her book, Starving to Heal in Siberia. Debilitated by the disease to the extent that she was no longer able to teach at her university or perform simple tasks like driving and reading, Michelle spent several years pursuing every known treatment from aggressive allopathic methods to holistic remedies that didn't work. While in her new book, Starving to Heal in Siberia, Dr. Slater explains her radical recovery from late stage Lyme disease and how it could help others. And when all failed to deliver recovery, she discovered a dry fasting program and spent two months in Siberia under a doctor's care. She recovered completely from Lyme disease, regaining her memory and returning to researching and writing, hiking and running. And since 2017, she has not experienced a single symptom. Dr. Slater is a scholar of comparative literature and president of the educational nonprofit Mayapple Center for the Arts and Humanities in Connecticut. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our very special guest today, Dr. Michelle Slater. Welcome. Dr. Bunn, thank you for that generous introduction and thank you for having me on your show. Oh, absolutely. I am so interested when people are dealing with Lyme disease because there's millions of people who just don't seem to be able to recover from it. But when you were diagnosed with Lyme, uh, how long did you have it before realizing what you actually had? So that's an excellent question, Dr. Bond. And I had mysterious debilitating symptoms long before I had a diagnosis because I didn't have that classic bullseye rash that, that some patients get when they get bitten by a tick. So I didn't know to get tested or that it could possibly be Lyme disease. And Lyme disease is called the great imitator because it does mimic so many other diseases symptoms. So the fatigue that I experienced could have been attributed to many things or a joint pain or even this sort of brain fog issue, which as a professor, it does not go well with my profession to have brain fog. So it took, it, it, it took a few years before I had a diagnosis and we had tried everything and I had been tested for Lyme disease. And I actually did at one point have a tick bite and had that tested. Everything came back negative, which is another thing that Lyme patients suffer from is that a lot of the tests are not accurate. So it, it was a few years before I had a diagnosis in hand. And unfortunately, Dr. Bond, at that point, the doctor said that it was already chronic Lyme because the road to a diagnosis had been so unreliable. Well, did you actually have the visible rash that people see? So I didn't. As I said, I since I didn't have the rash, I didn't. And, and that's another controversial um, topic is that so many patients don't get that rash. So it cannot be determined to be the factor in, in knowing whether one has Lyme disease. So because I didn't get the rash and because any test that I'd had for Lyme had initially come out as negative, we had ruled that out and moved on to other things. And as you know, autoimmune, autoimmune disorders or chronic fatigue they just, they fall into this nebulous category of mystery disorders that are impossible to treat. And, you know, doctors, doctors really don't know what to do with patients like me. Well, what, was there a particular test that you end up having that absolutely confirmed that you have Lyme disease? Because I know that a lot of viewers and listeners uh, watching and listening right now are wondering, well, I have a lot of those symptoms, but they keep telling me that I don't have Lyme but could they? Absolutely, absolutely. So I did have, so after a, a, few, a couple of years of, of, of these alarming symptoms, I did have a definitive test that pointed to the fact that I had Lyme. And from there, I took the standard treatment of 200 milligrams of antibiotics. It really did not help at this point because it had become chronic. And so at that point, I sought out a leading Lyme specialist in Connecticut. And when I went to see him, he ran a very sophisticated panel of blood tests. He's, he's really like a medical um, sleuth when it comes to finding things in the body with Lyme patients. Dr. Stephen Phillips, who has just um, written um, a, a book about Lyme called Chronic with, with Dana Parrish. 
And, and so he said, Michelle, your CD57 levels of these, this particular white blood cell, they're, com they're completely depressed. They're rock bottom. It shows that this has been in your body for a very long time. And so, you know, his, his panel of tests was able to pick up co-infections and various other things that just a standard doctor treating Lyme disease wouldn't have been able to find. And, and so then we went into this mega treatment, um, 15, not 200 milligrams, but 1500 milligrams a day of, of antibiotics and antimicrobials. And we did that on his treatment plan uh, for, quite some, for quite some time with a, a pulsing treatment where you do sort of two weeks on or two weeks off. And that's not the exact treatment protocol, but of that nature. And, and so I did go through that for, for quite some time. And I would have periods of, of relief and I thought that I was getting better. And then I would just get slammed back down again to, to the extent that I, I kept being told, well, you have to kind of acclimate to this new normal. And it, it felt so abnormal to me that it led me on a pursuit to other treatment plans. Yeah, I mean, when I hear doctors say the new normal and they add disability to it, nobody thinks disability is the new normal, especially when it comes to things like Lyme. And I can understand why so many people are getting misdiagnosed, uh, mistreated, taking medications that will do nothing. And as when somebody's dealing with Lyme long term, this is a bacteria that gets very deep seated into the tissues and very hard to uh, get rid of. Now, I understand that you tried numerous therapies that didn't work, and you even considered assisted suicide. Why? I did. I did, Dr. Bond. And, and actually, I will say that it was not related to depression. And some studies, such as the one in neuropsychiatric um, um, disease and treatment disorders, um, point that the, about 1,200 suicides a year in the U.S. can be attributed to, to Lyme disease because of these depression-inducing um, cytokines as an inflammatory response. That was not my case. I had found that my body had become uninhabitable. I couldn't, I couldn't write, I couldn't teach, I couldn't run, I couldn't spend quality time with my loved ones. I, I could not get out of bed. And, and, I, and I thought that my body had become uninhabitable. And if I couldn't, if I couldn't, you know, inhabit my body the way that I wanted to, then I thought that, you know, I wasn't bringing light to anyone at that point. Well, so that led me there. Yeah, no, I completely understand that. And, you know, I, I've read cases where people chose assisted suicide, uh, terminal conditions, uh, and it's hard to really fathom, even from my end, uh, what people deal with with Lyme, uh, thinking that it's that type of disease that they'll never recover from. Um, but how did you discover dry fasting? And how did it help you and how can it help other people who suffer with Lyme disease, even other autoimmune disorders? Yes, thank you for asking that key question, because this is the question and this is what I want to share because, you know, now my mission in life is to, is to pay this forward because I never thought that I would get my life back. I, re I, really, I really thought that was unfathomable at that point. And so before I went the assisted suicide route, I was going to exhaust everything possible. And I just discovered one day in bed with all of my pain and fatigue, I discovered this, this doctor on a forum. And at that point I had developed an autoimmune disorder because my body, my immune system was just so depressed. And so I was actually not looking for Lyme disease. I was looking for that. And I found this mythological sounding Dr. Sergei Ivanovich Filonov, who talked about the cells um, without the presence of water um, turning into mini, almost like nuclear reactors and killing off diseased tissues. And I thought this is, this is the most intriguing thing I've, I've ever heard of. And I realized that it was related to the very simple concept of autophagy or you know eating one's diseased, the body self eating one's diseased tissues and pathogens, something that you know um, 
Dr. Yoshinori Osumi won the Nobel Prize for it in 2016 for his research on how the body degrades and recycles disease cells. And so I looked him up and I found him. I tracked him down. I begged him to take me as a patient, which involved me having to go to Siberia for two months and into the mountains to his very rustic clinic and follow this very intensive protocol to sort of um, it's like I call it like marathon training the body to dry fast that we all have this innate capacity in ourselves to do this, but we can't just go out and do an extended dry fast. So under his care, under his very expert medical care, I trained my body as he as he coached me to do. And while I was there, I worked up to being able to do nine consecutive days with no food, no water, not touching any liquids at all and even following a mild walking program that he had me do and there were you know where there there were different massages involved to you know facilitate the process and 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 to everyone's astonishment back in the US I came back from Siberia feeling and almost looking like I was 17 and ready to go, fully ready to go. And as soon as I got back, I was like, I have to start writing Starving to Heal in Siberia because now I have to share this with these people who are out there in their beds thinking that they're never going to get better. Now, kind of walk, walk us through dry fasting. How in the world did you start it? Now, you said you worked up to nine days of dry fasting. So that means no food, no water, not even getting near any type of liquid. Um, how do you work up to that? And what do you do with your time during the day? Are there any other additional therapies along with it? So those are all those are all legitimate questions. And the, and I would like to first say that, you know, I am not a medical doctor, I can share what has worked for me. And to say that I very carefully worked with Dr. Filanov, who is an MD, and he does do coachings online on zoom. So I would not recommend that anyone just cold turkey, start dry fasting. However, I, I will say that I, I started with one day of dry fasting. And I would say that the initial ones one day and three days are, are probably the hardest because the body has not done this before. And so, you know, one is more attentive to say thirst or a dry mouth or, but I thought, well, I'm already tired. I'm already in bed. This is, this is not any worse than what I have to do every day. So that helped me get through the first ones that he had me do at home before I went to Siberia. And then when I went to Siberia, I did first a seven day with him and then a period of recovery and, you know, fluids and then the nine days. So within the two months that I was there, I did a seven day and a nine day. So that's how you work up. You work out, he, he has most people, you know, stop taking medications if they safely can, you know, get off if they're on it, you know, um, dietary things that might not be helpful, you know, having a reduced diet of, you know, very plant-based and then maybe water fasting, and and then working up to dry fasting because I had already done a lot of fasting in my I was I had been a raw vegan for a long time I he felt that I was I could pretty much start with the dry fasting so after the first short ones I worked up to the longer one and I have to say Dr. Bond at that point it just felt very meditative and I didn't mind doing it all and I almost had no adverse symptoms other than you know during the day after my walk and after the massage and and cupping treatments that they did to just facilitate this um cellular decongestion i i, I would rest outside or i would read you know i wasn't reading lacan and derrida like i usually did but i was reading you know i i was reading poetry or i was you know um you know some essays and so I would spend my time reading or listening to music or just enjoying the beautiful Siberian nature and and, and I just kept saying my body is the doctor I'm going to surrender to this and just hope that I heal so I it, I meditated a lot it became a very peaceful process in fact even now when I do maintenance dry fasts which I, which my doctor recommends for everyone because of the way our world has become so toxic. 
I find that it's a very meditative, peaceful process. Yeah. Now, I also noticed in your book that uh, you would spend, you know, while you were in Siberia, that you would spend time outdoors uh, and even spending time down by the river. Was there a reason for that? Yes. Thank you for thank you for noticing that. I think that uh, being, being outdoors is very important because especially in a place that's not polluted, like I do mention in my book, I, I've, I've dry faceted in Houston and it's it really shouldn't be done there. You want to dry fast in a place where there are very few pollutants in the air and you're, you're even absorbing the moisture that's in the air just naturally. So it does facilitate it. And being by moving water, when you're putting no water in your body, there is something about it that almost feels very healing. And I've heard this now from multiple patients who have also dry fasted. There is something restorative about at least being by moving water in nature. And I even slept outside. He recommended that I just bring my sleeping bag outside. So I did that and I, I would, I would sleep outside and I was, I was really outdoors all the time during this process. Well, did, so did the doctor also believe in uh, grounding? Um, so when you say grounding, that means being out, are, being outside, basically, uh, you know, barefoot, with the earth for uh, receiving the natural electromagnetic field that also has restorative uh, healing to the body. And I was kind of wondering, as I was reading your book, that you spent a lot of time outdoors and even mentioned in your book that you slept outdoors. And I was wondering if the, the grounding had additional healing to the body because uh, it, you even uh, said that your back pain was gone as well. Yes, and, and he would say that the back pain, the disappearance of the back pain was also related to just clearing the cellular debris in my body. And then the treatments that they do post dry fasting also really facilitate that. But that is, that's an excellent point. And I think that there must be something to it. He would probably be with you on that. I, I happen to be a nature person myself i mean right now i'm in chamonix mont blanc i'm taking every opportunity to go hiking and just be outside so i i think that could very much be part of it i wouldn't i wouldn't deny that at all but it's not in his specific treatment plan well you know kind of walk us through some of the myths uh behind dry fasting so a lot of so all of my viewers and listeners can get a really clear picture you know, as to what they, you know, most people, the moment they hear no food, no water, they just think they're starving to death. I mean, did you have to deal with feelings of hunger? So, yes, I'm very happy to walk your, your viewers and listeners um, through this. Um, I did not deal with, you don't deal with hunger while you're dry fasting, whereas you do when you're water fasting or even juicing. When you're dry fasting, it would be it would be more of a thirst issue than a hunger issue because your mouth is so dry, you really don't want to put any food in your body. And I would say that the initial one day and three day, and I will, I'm not dry fasting, so I would say that the initial one day and three day had more thirst issues than the seven day and the nine day and my sub subsequent maintenance, the body becomes used to it. It really is like training for a marathon running. Your body becomes acclimated to it and, and, and then it's ready to go. So that isn't so much an issue um, eventually, but I will say that this myth that the that the body can't survive beyond three days with um you know without water well i'm living proof of that as are the patients that he's treated for 30 years but I, but what he says is that you know the organs get a rest during this whole, whole procedure and that even one kilo of of fat in the body or adipose tissue can provide enough calories nutrients for two to three days of dry fasting and in addition he talks a lot about inflammation and how it can't exist in the presence of water. So when, when we deprive the body of water, then it goes into its internal water supply and it starts capitalizing on that. And so the body cells are competing with the pathogens for water. And, and it's, it's really a very elegant process, the way that Dr. Osumi describes it in his, um, 
in his work of cellular degradation. So at this point, you know, the body is safely protected because the organs are getting rest. And then meanwhile, this very sophisticated process of breaking down cellular debris and diseased cells is taking place. Now, all of that being said, you have to really respect that process. Dry fasting is like natural surgery, my doctor says. So, you know, I was talking to someone who was doing his first nine day dry fasting. He's like, I think I'm going to go play basketball. And I was like, no, you're not going to play basketball. You are going to take a nice walk and rest. So you have to really respect this process and, and not do anything that would, um, you know, that really would hinder it. So gentle walking and, and having a rest and not taxing the mind too much either. It's not a time to think that you're going to continue working in your regular workday as you dry fast. So I think, you know, respecting all of that, uh, it's a very safe procedure if it is, if the protocol is respected. Yeah. And I know I have talked to other people who have done dry fasting for as long as seven days. And, and as I was reading your book, I was learning that, uh, according to your doctor, the body, you know, all of the weak cells, um, I guess they break down, but it's the healthy cells, the strong cells that survive through dry fasting. And it's enabling the body to basically rebuild itself completely and I've heard stories where people had their complete immune systems rebuilt, overcame autoimmune disease. And like you, you can overcame Lyme. And, um, and definitely, ladies and gentlemen, if you ever consider dry fasting, you need to be under a doctor's care. You need to have a medical checkup done beforehand because some, many of you are taking medications uh, that you need to be uh, monitored uh, because, look, we believe in using wisdom and we want to be safe about this. But, uh, you know, uh, Michelle, as much as I've read about dry fasting, I am in incredibly amazed the healing power that this has done for so many people. It, it is amazing. Absolutely. And that, that I had Lyme disease and also an autoimmune disorder and, you know, a whole host of, of issues at that point. And for them to have disappeared. And then the patients who I have seen go to Dr. Filano for not just Lyme disease, but you know, autoimmune disorders, chronic fatigue, a whole host of a whole range of medical issues. And to see them get their lives back is is nothing short of miraculous to me. So, you know, I, I'm very grateful for that. I really respect the the treatment and the delicate balance of, of life. And so I, I echo everything that you say about making sure to undertake this treatment with a medical doctor like Dr. Filanov, who is really at this time, the only medical doctor known in the world who has a 30 year clinical experience um, with, with treating patients. So most medical doctors are, are going to, are, you know, react with great fear to this because the the myths are the myths are are deeply seated but yeah, I'm, um, I'm really that you know this really does work <laughs> oh yeah i know it works because uh, you're not the only, like i said you're not the only one that i know that's actually gone through dry fasting but i'm very interested about the mental state i know that fasting of any kind um can really bring on a much deeper uh, insight, um, increased focus. Did that happen for you? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I, I felt, I, I felt a deep sense of peace. I felt, I felt, I kept having a little epiphanies. I kept a journal. I wanted to write things down. I kept feeling that I was having insights and, and then after, so there is in the initial drive, I fast I did there was initial recovery period that was far more difficult than the dry fast itself because all this debris was then moving out of the body as I started drinking hot water that's for another um, another um, session altogether but but I would say that after the initial dry fasts I would I would end the dry fast and almost boom immediately I could go right back to running or, or working on my book, and I would have amazing mental clarity and focus. So all of those things are true. There is, and there is, there is 
there is a heightened sense of almost a meditative awareness while you're fasting. And that really does help with the fast. And I found yeah. that in a lot of people. Yeah. And I can, I, I believe that wholeheartedly. Now, do you now walk us through, so let's say you're going to, you're going to end a dry fast. How do you safely end a dry fast? Yes, this is, I'm so glad that you asked this because this is the most critical point. As, as my doctor says, the exit is the most critical. It's more important than the dry fast itself. And so what he does is when he decides that it's time for a patient to end the fast, then the patient rests with hot water. And, it, and then he decides what the period of time is going to be for the hot water, but only hot water. And, and for me, I usually do about two days of hot water because, you know, it really, it, I, I like to give my body time. And then, and then it's a very, very simple, tiny, tiny portions of a very healthy food. So of course he's based in Russia. So it's like this buckwheat kasha porridge, or it will be, you know, watermelon, which is very hydrating to the cells and kidneys. And, and then there might be very simple vegetable salads with cabbage and carrots and various things, cucumbers. And eventually he will, he will bring out the fish soup. So there, so a variety of very, very simple, nourishing, healing foods, but the, the most critical thing is never to just jump into eating solid foods or anything seasoned with oil, salt, fried animal products. It's you have to really, really be careful with your body after it's gone through this process of, as I said, natural surgery. So the, that is the, that is the most critical part to respect the exit. Yeah, it it absolutely makes sense. Now, Michelle, do you believe in intermittent fasting? So I I believe that for the average healthy person, I think that the work that Mark Matson has done is is really brilliant um, on intermittent fasting. So I think that for the average healthy person, that it can it can be an excellent tool along with a healthy lifestyle of fitness and and solid nutrition. But I, I but I had I had done intermittent fasting and a, and a variety of things to no avail for me. So I think that it's helpful in a healthy lifestyle, but in terms of eradicating a serious illness like the one that I had and so many people do have, I haven't found it to be effective. Wow, yeah, because I know so many people use intermittent fasting to either help with mostly, I think it's to help with weight loss and to maintain a a healthy weight. Um, but when it comes to healing or I guess in your case, radical healing, I can see where dry fasting would be of great benefit. Now, where can all of my viewers and listeners get your new book, Starving to Heal in Siberia, and learn more about dry fasting? Yes, well, I'm pleased to report that Starving to Heal in Siberia is coming out September 13th, and it can be found on Amazon for pre-order and Barnes and Noble, a variety of places at this point. Um, there is also a website and a Facebook page devoted to the book. Uh, there's an Instagram account, Michelle Slater NY. And so we are, we're constantly sharing recipes from the book and, and videos of readings. And I'm very, very excited to, to share my, my book, uh, Starving to Heal, with anyone who it might possibly help. And I'm grateful to you for giving me the opportunity to speak about this very radical form of healing. No, I'm, I'm honored to have you on to talk about it because I want to see people set free from debilitating disease and Lyme is one of those diseases very difficult to diagnose even by medical means and uh, ladies and gentlemen Dr. Michelle Slater's brand new book debuting September 13th starving to heal in Siberia Dr. Slater explains her radical recovery from late stage Lyme disease and how it could help others. So ladies and gentlemen, if you're dealing with Lyme disease and you need to learn more, again, get her, her book, Starving to Heal in Siberia. Where there's a will, there's a way, and we're here to bring you 
life-changing wellness. And in this case, this was life-changing wellness for Michelle Slater. Uh, Dr. Slater, thank you so much for being on the program today. Dr. Braun, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Oh, my pleasure as well. And again, ladies and gentlemen, Starving to Heal in Siberia will debut September 13th. Check Amazon.com and all of the other outlets for this brand new book. It is worth the read. I have read her book. You will learn more than you'll ever know. And not only that, you'll have knowledge to gain to help yourself as well as to help others. We'll be right back after this.